Hello, and welcome to Jung at Harp. Today, we are going to talk about psychic gardening. Oh, what seeds we use, how those seeds grow, the common pests that we might encounter. I am Deborah Henson Conant, and I'm here with Kathleen Wiley. I'm a composer and a performer, and Kathleen is a Jungian psychoanalyst, and we both play the harp, so we call this Jung at Harp. So, Kathleen, uh, every week we have a list of things that we think we might want to talk about, and eventually we disco discovered this was what we want to talk about today. For me, it all happened, my curiosity about this happened, because my cat got really sick, and I thought she was dying. And I took her to the vet, and, um, and I was like, wow, this is what death looks like. I, I, I didn't know. And I took her to the vet, and the vet said, no, she's allergic to something. And it turns out she was allergic to some new food I was giving her. Some fish. Who knew a cat is allergic to fish? As I watched her go into her sickness, she started looking weird. She started hiding in the closet. She lived in the closet. She lived in the dark. She made a cave. She would turn herself away. So she went into hiding. As I took away that food and put her, her new old food back, I watched her recovery. And this was fascinating to watch first the visual completely changed. She, her fur grew back, all, her eyes start, stopped popping out. She started coming out of the cave. She, then she started jumping around. And I was like, wow, this is a picture of someone recovering. She's going back to her natural state. And then I started thinking about, wow, you know, what, what is our natural state? What are, you know, what are we, what might we be allergic to? And then I started thinking about what is the seed and then so on and so forth. And so that's how we kind of got to this idea. Um, what is that seed of us? How do we get back to the natural seed of us? Is there a super natural seed of us? And how do we grow that? What's that blueprint that we grow into? And so Kathleen, I <laughs> you have ideas about this. And I'm also really curious, um, you know, like, I'm curious, what are your ideas and what are Jung's ideas and how do they come together in what you're going to say? Yeah, well, I'm not always sure I can tell you because once I um, study and experience and observe, there is a natural growth process that combines things to produce the fruit of what I say. So I, I sometimes I can say this is from this was what Jung said and point you to that in his writings. But other times my take on it is my take. It's kind of like what that seed thought has grown in the garden and the soil of my psyche with my own thought processes, my own historical experiences, my own other studies and pursuits. So, and maybe that's the good starting point here about the um, the intelligences you saw at work in your cat and the recovery. Um, you know, even Western doctors will say to you that what they do basically is help you be patient while the body heals itself. And they may offer interventions like medicines or procedures to facilitate that process, but it's always in line with the basic intelligences of the body. Jung very much believed that our psyche has that same kind of intelligence, that there is an operating system, if we want to call it that, um, that is uniquely you and uniquely me or uniquely whoever's listening. And that uniqueness also is the flesh on the skeleton blueprint of the skeleton of psyche that we all share, just like we all share a common skeleton of our physical body, but it gets fleshed out with muscle and sinew and ligaments in a very different way. So our psyches are the same. There's a common skeleton or template, which, for Jung is his model of psyche that we've alluded to and talked about off and on, um, but it's fleshed out in very different ways. So when we look at gardening and we look at gardening as a metaphor for our own healing, like for your cat and our own wholeness for our fullness of our creative expression, like with our music, then part of what we have to begin to know is the composition of the soil of our own psyche. 
And I, I, thought, I, thought you were going, I thought you were going to say the composition of our soul. As I think so, I, I don't know if the soul and the soil, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's not an etymological connection, but uh, anyway, go on. <laughs> well, I, that would be interesting. Maybe soil and soul do come from the same root. I don't know, we'd have, we'd have to look that up real quick. Um, well, I do think that our soul, our, our soul is the um, kind of the container of the soil, so to speak. You know, just like for some reason there was something in this cat food that you think is the fish that your cat was allergic to, even though traditionally or common knowledge or the collective thought is cats love fish and it doesn't hurt them. So we kind of have to learn about our soil in the same way by observation <laughs> and by tracking the effect of the things we take in, you know, the systems of thought we take in, the emotions that we take in, the emotions that get triggered in us that we digest. <laughs> um, you know, we have to be, be able to see how we are specifically impacted. And it's great to understand the common impact of certain emotions and the common purpose of certain emotions. But what's most important is what is what really is happening in us, in our psyche, in the soil of our psyche soul. And we can only learn that through being curious and observing and tracking. So I'm really interested in this tracking thing because um, I know that in every, for example, 12 step world is all about recovery. Mm -hmm. and, um, I mean, they're almost synonymous and tracking is, an, I believe is a characteristic, no matter what fellowship it is, tracking is a, is a characteristic of that. And I know that if I had been tracking what I fed my, what I fed my cats, that I, it might've become quite obvious to me immediately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I'm thinking tracking and, um, and I'm also thinking the idea of growth to wholeness and, and, and here's what my brain is avoiding thinking. I'm avoiding thinking, Oh, we grow until we we are big enough to eat, and then we, you know, and then we start dying. I mean, because I don't, my brain, I don't want to go there yet because I feel like I've just, I feel like I'm just coming to that moment of my life where I'm able to open rather than close doors for myself, mm -hmm. within myself. Uh, um, so, so that that's one of the reasons I'm really fascinated by this idea. Uh, that I may have been feeding myself, and I'm assuming we all feed ourselves things our whole lives, possibly even thinking that they're healthy for us. And and in fact, we're having this reaction and an allergy, I believe, is is like an autoimmune response. Is that correct? Where we, we where we go back on our where we're, we're protecting ourselves by kind of disintegrating ourselves and hopefully you know somebody who knows more about that will um, pop in or at, at some point in this conversation um so I'm 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 aware that there are things I'm feeding myself anyway I'm just curious about that blooming oh my god I'm, I'm thinking about a piece that I wrote um uh, from anyway, it's a long time ago, but there's a, um, a part in it where this doctor is talking about life. And she, there's one part in where she says, you know, life comes so silently, you know, and anyway, life blooms and flowers, blooms and flowers, even as our trials and our troubles and our lies bruise her and weaken her, even as we squander the treasure she is warping and wasting the gift that she gives, she blooms and flowers, she blooms and flowers. And and she's talking about that this very thing that even as we destroy our lives you know in whatever ways little or big that we do life is still trying to bloom and flower and i saw that in that cat that blooming the, the immediate you know the immediate response it, may, it, may, it took a while but it, it, she bloomed right Right. And so, 
how do we, <laughs> how do we? Well, I think part of it is recognizing that there are seasons of growth. I mean, if we're going to stay with our image of psychic gardening, there are seasons of growth. And here we are close to the start of spring. We're, we're filming this in March, um, almost mid-March. And, you know, I don't know about in Boston, but here in um, North Carolina, things are starting to pop up in my garden. It's like little things, yeah. yeah. And some of what's popping up are things I've planted that I want. And then there's this one very prolific, curious looking cabbage-like weed that I'm thinking, oh, this looks like something I really might not want to leave because it looks like it could really take over. And it looks like it could have come in some leaf mulch I brought in last year to nurture my garden. So part of how we bloom, again, is an organic process we have no control over. But just like with our garden, we can nurture it by planting things we want. We can pull up things we don't want, things we don't want being things like negative self-talk any of the arms of self-hate, um, you know, self-destructive behaviors and patterns. Those are the kinds of things we can pull up by, by responding differently. There's you know, the, and there's rabbits, by the way. And, yeah, and we can set the trap for the rabbits. Here it's the deer. I planted these wonderful Perilander roses last year and the deer just loved eating the little flower buds that were coming. I mean, we so... We can begin to say, how am I going to protect myself from that critter that wants to eat my bloom? And of course, last week and over the last few months, we've talked about a lot. How do you deal with criticism, <laughs> which is like the deer that eats your bloom yeah. when you may offer something of your creative right. self in the form right. of, a, a, of a musical greeting card? So we have to be able to identify those things, acknowledge they're there, identify what it is, identify its destructiveness, have an intention about what we want to be different, and then focus on taking that action or cultivating that state of belief or that consciousness. You know, I'm back in the trap because I'm, because I'm imagining if you trap a rabbit, then what do you do with it? You know, so, um, so I'm and I'm yeah. thinking that that last year what we did is simply protect the things that we saw being eat, eaten. We we realized it was pretty simple to protect. Um, so so that's good for me to know just to think about that. You know, it, it is possible to deter or to just to to or to deflect. Yeah, I, I'm thinking about what do you do if we catch the rabbit. So after I moved to my um, the house that I'm in now, which is in a rural part um, of um, the county on, on the lake, I um, have a, had a convertible that was being parked kind of under a little shed lean-to. And the uh, there was a neighborhood cat or a wild cat that started walking on my convertible top and sleeping on it. And so here my um, triple black uh, Camaro Z28 Super Sport convertible. <laughs> My muscle car era, for those of you who are out there who are muscle car um, lovers, um, was being covered with this blonde cat hair and I was not happy. So a man I was dating at the time said, oh, I have a cat trap. You can catch the cat and then take it to the Humane Society. So I set the trap. Well, you know, I caught a raccoon this big mama raccoon and I caught a possum and uh, I finally quit when I caught this baby raccoon that I had heard all night long trying to scratch his way out. Um, I mean, this, but, sounds like, this sounds like dating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you're going to really laugh at me. So the first raccoon that I caught, I thought, well, I don't want to let him out here in the yard. So silly me, what do I do? I walk across the street and let him out in the woods. And as I'm walking back across the street, I thought, that was really stupid, Kathleen. I mean, you think the raccoon's not going to come back across the street <laughs> anyway. But the, the, no, but the no, point, no, I think that's I think that's a really good point though, because um in just in terms of 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 um 
as we start to try to protect the garden that is us, and how do we deal with those pests? Because, um, because often we are just taking them across the street. And, and, and in fact, wow, I mean, how do, whew, how do we protect the gardens of our minds? I mean, with, yeah. with animals, kind of, they live here too. You know, is there a way, is there a way for us to live with them? I don't know. But, 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 but that's going to happen. Like, for example, there's going to be other people mm -hmm. who are acting in, in ways that might trigger me. That's always going to happen. I think of that as being a raccoon, you know, in the trap or whatever, whatever. How do I live with those things? I feel like we're going off on a, on a like, I don't even know where we're going, which is great. This, that's good um, because we always come to somewhere. So, so we've got this brain. I mean, we've got this mind. We've got this self. It's got the soil of the soul. It's got the seed of who we are. We want to grow it. There are, we've been feeding, we've been putting, you know, crap in. So it's, it's partly a garden and it's partly an animal. <laughs> I don't know. It's, who the hell? Okay. And um, we're putting in this uh, and, and, and the, the question is, How, how do we garden, how do we, how, what do we do so that it can bloom? How do we garden in a way that allows that to bloom and doesn't kill off everything around us? Well, so two things. I think that there are things we can do to protect. So what I ultimately did is I quit trying to trap the cat. I got mouse traps and I, set the mouse traps, put them on the convertible top with aluminum foil over them so that when the cat would jump up, the aluminum, they'd hit the aluminum foil, the aluminum foil would immediately set off the traps, scare the cat and the cat would go. That took care of the cat landing on my convertible top. So we have this image to play with of how do we, what, what would it, that look like energetically to set the mousetrap. We're not hurting anybody, right. but we're just doing a loud clap and they go away. Second thing with the raccoons is, yeah, they live here. So I used to laugh and when I was trying to do composting, it never failed what I did. I would come out in the door to my little earth bin would be pushed up or it would be dug under. So I finally just said, okay, I'm feeding the raccoons. And I have a raccoon feeding station across the street where I put all of my produce. I just thought, okay, we got to live with the raccoons. Mm -hmm. With the deer we, or the rabbits, you can put fencing up around your garden that they can't get through. So I think in terms of how do we nurture our blooms, the mm -hmm. first thing we got to remember is sometimes no matter what we do, there's a bad growing season and what we want to grow doesn't. That's the first thing we have to remember. Okay. Second thing we have to know again, is that we have to tend to all the variables that are affecting the growing season. So like we have a, there's a, it's, I'm hearing there's a bunch of relationships that we have. A bunch of relationships that we have that we have to tend. So I have to look at the soil in my psyche. So for instance, one of the things that I've recently been pondering and we've talked about is how do we move beyond resistance? And I decided in this one particular um, action in relationship to some readers that I have that I was going to quit worrying about getting it just right and being perfect and just reach out. I know that's one of your big tenets. So, oh. Yeah. Not that I can do it, but I know that it works. <laughs> yeah. And so I thought I'm going to do that. So then after I made that intention and sent an email then I started looking at, okay, what is it that really is the foundation of my inaction? So then I began to pay attention to how little things go through my mind, like, well, gosh, I'm just too tired for that, or I don't want one more thing I have to do, or God, at the end of a long day from clients, I'm tired of being in front of the computer. All these kinds of little thoughts that were creating a foundation to support my inaction. So 
once I could see that, I could begin to say, wait a minute, is that really true? Or okay, if it is true at the end of the day, I'm tired, then can I get up 30 minutes early and do it at the start of my day? I began to be able to intervene with those variables. And so I think that's, again, a good metaphor we find in gardening. We intervene with the variables. If we know our soil is deficit in nitrogen and the plant we're growing needs nitrogen, we add nitrogen. So I think part of it is we have to be willing to engage with, be in relationship to what is and isn't growing and all of the variables that will affect it. And clearly for our creative process and for action on our own behalf and blooming wherever we're blooming, our self-talk, our actions, you know, our state of our body mind, you know, are we rested? Are we eating good food? Are we getting exercise? The psychological principle of compensation, you know, we can be focused for so long and then we have to have some unfocused time. You know, so we have to tend to those basic ingredients, if we want to call them. Well, I'm thinking, I'm thinking as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking that you started out by tracking your, um, tracking your inaction. Mm -hmm. So, and we've talked about this before, that the three parts of change are awareness, process, relationship. Those are the states. And so I'm hearing that again. You tracked your inaction. So, and then you looked at the process. So you became aware, then you started looking at the process. And then, and then as, as soon as you started saying that, I was thinking, well, if you can track your inaction, you can also track your action. Yes. And so you can start looking at both those things yes. and become more aware of what's getting in the way. And, and I'm, I'm looking in this case that when you do the thing that you have an intention of doing, that's a moment of bloom. And it's a mm -hmm. moment, I'm gonna mix metaphors here, like I always do, but it's a moment of bloom because it opens a door. When you have an intention to do something and you do it, it opens a door. When you don't do it, the door stays closed. Yes. Now, I don't know how, what that has to do with gardening and I don't know, I was just, I don't, I've been, I'm, I'm, yeah, I don't know why I started thinking about this while you were talking, is that last year, um, Chris, the guy I, you know, we collaborate on the garden, um, we decided we wanted to have a huge field of golden yellow flowers, and we had a bunch of yellow flowers, so we just saved all the seeds, so now we have jars and jars and jars and jars and jars of all the seeds of all the flowers that we had and then when i go out on a run sometimes i'll grab you know if somebody's dead flowers i'll grab them and you know bring them home and get the seeds i don't know what that has to do with what you said but i felt like it was there was something there about having the seed of what i want having it so that i can then put it into the soil I can add it to the soil as well as just kind of waiting around to see what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I can take from the past the things that I want to have growing more. Mm -hmm. And I can intentionally seed them into the present. Now, I have no idea how to do that. And I don't know why I started seeing that image while you were talking, but, but I think we're talking about process. We're talking about awareness of being able to track what you do want and what you don't want and being able to tell the difference. I also saw, I found this book that we've made the first year we were gardening together, which was like probably 10 years ago. <clears throat> and he pulled out, <laughs> for me, and it, I should show it, it, he pulled out and he took a picture of him and it would say, we, good, good plant, bad plant. It was just <laughs> showing me so I would know what, what to pull out and what not to pull out. And so he was helping me become aware so that we could collaborate on this garden together. And then as the years went on, we, we got more proactive about it, not just, you know, you know, saving the things that we want and bringing them in. Um, and then there's going to be the energy, like each year I want a big field of yellow, but each year I don't necessarily do the thing. So you were talking about intention. 
I can have it in my brain. I, in my brain, I'm like, yes, we have planting day and we go out and the blah, blah, blah. But that doesn't mean I do it. Yeah, so part of what you said, and I like the metaphor of planting seeds, is that we plant seeds through our attention and focus. And then intention gets into the mix as part of the motivation. So how do we plant seeds? We plant seeds through what, what we give our attention to. You know, there's the old Cherokee story about, you know, do you feed, um, you know, whatever, whatever you give yes. attention to grows. Right, right. And that's a, that is um, a truth. It's a psycho-spiritual truth. So, you know, if you want to plant yellow flowers, then you focus on yellow flowers. And so it's the same, you know, if I want to move forward on sending this email to this group of people consistently, then I have to focus for it. I have to give it some attention. Maybe on a practical level, that means putting it on my calendar when I'm going to do it. Maybe it means blocking off time to do it. Maybe it means having a notebook of, or a file where I have ideas of what I'm going to share. But it requires focus and attention and an intention, which is like harnessing the desire to act on the impulse to actually do it. I, I'm, and as you're talking, I'm also thinking that what I'm thinking about all the jars of seeds that Chris and I now have. And, um, and I'm thinking that we don't expect every single one of these seeds to grow. And we don't, <laughs> we don't sit there watching every one of these seeds, but by collecting them and and, and trying to make the soil ready for them and then attending them and by having more, more than we like probably, I don't know, 50 times more than we expect to actually grow, we plant. Um, I think that's also part of that growth of a garden. And I think that in, in my life, I tend to think like, but this, this is the thing and I'm gonna work on that and that's gonna be the perfect thing and then that's gonna grow. And then rather than thinking, only one of these five or 50 or, or something like that is, is going to actually take seed, whatever that means, takes, take seed, uh, I guess that means like, okay, where the seed like wakes up and says, right, I'm going to be a plant. <laughs> because I see some, some of the others are like, yeah, I'm going to be, I'm going to be bird food. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I don't know what they're thinking. <laughs> Well, yeah, we don't know because, you know, there is this, again, this organic intelligence at work and there are all these other variables at play in, in nature. And the same is true for us, that there are all these variables at play in our own nature. And, you know, with consciousness, again, we, part of what we can do is really say, okay, that seed over there that I wanted isn't growing, but this seed is. So I'm going to put energy and nurture this seed. You know? I'm also thinking as you're talking, I'm thinking that there's, there's the external environment or the conditions. We've talked about that, the weather conditions. Um, and then there's the condition of the soil. So I'm thinking about that in terms of us. The condition of the soil is what is the condition? What's our spiritual condition? Mm -hmm. And then the conditions outside are um, like the weather. And, and unlike, uh, I mean, like global warming, except that we can do it individually very much more quickly, we can actually create more conducive conditions as we stop fighting with people or as we engage with people more or as we ask people for help or our relationships with humans. And so how does bloom? It helps us bloom. How does that Absolutely. happen? Absolutely. And we can make choices. I mean, part of what you're talking about is we can make choices. So if I make a choice to be open with you and be curious with you and you are open and curious with me, even if we have a different perspective or ideas on things, then together we grow something. So we both then receive, we give and receive. 
So we definitely need each other. And and to your, I love the image of your um, your friend Chris pulling up, doing the picture of good plant, bad plant, pull this one. Maybe I need to send him a picture of this weed I think I have growing and make sure it's a oh, weed. He would tell you, he would tell you what it yeah. is. Because it looks like it's going to have some gorgeous little yellow flowers. So, well, you know. I think, I think this is really important. Like, what is a weed and what yeah. isn't a weed? That's a good and, question. And, and why? I mean, and I know that there was a, uh, something that started growing in our garden years ago. And I was like, that's yeah, beautiful. It's got these little purple flowers. I, I want more of that. And I remember my partner at the time said, yeah, it looks nice now, but, but here's what's going to happen. It's going to take over and it's going to actually, um, it's going to eat away all the other vegetation. And so that's why we don't want it. And, and so that kind of helped me see, and I'm, I wonder if that's a little bit like addiction. Oh, here's this thing that looks really cool. I'll try that, but that's actually going to, or, or any bad habit, um, that's going to destroy the, the, the soil of my, of my spiritual garden. So um, I'm, I'm, sometimes I'm embarrassed because like this is called Jung at Harp, and I'm like, wait a minute, what does, okay, what would Jung say here? <laughs> And, and I love that, and I want to go back to one of the very first things you said, which was, um, you know, I don't necessarily know, you know, which is me and which is young at this point. And I think that's really beautiful. And I want to bring it to something you just said. You said something about giving and receiving, but I heard it as giving and receding. Re uh, receding. Um, uh, so that things grow in each of us as our gardens uh, interact. And, um, and I think you know, I think this is one of the beauties and maybe this answers my question. My question was, you know, what is our natural state? What, how, how do we know when we actually get to our natural state since we're still feeding ourselves all kinds of weird stuff? Mm -hmm. and, um, and then is there an ultra natural state, which might be when we're in epiphany or when we're, you know, have an idea or whatever it is that just feels beyond. And I think I just realized that when we are seeding and receding each other, when we're in conversation, it, it, we're, when we're not alone, that is when we become supernatural. Meaning, it's not, it's just like what you said about Jung. It's no longer Jung's idea and Kathleen, but it's how Jung's idea has bloomed in Kathleen. And it's if I'm with somebody else, how have I bloomed in them and how have they bloomed in me? And that, what does that create? That's beautiful. Because that is what happens if we're going to integrate our experiences, our knowledge, our understanding, so that it really becomes ours. So all of the structures you've been providing in your uh, blueprints for creativity for your students, the, the, the whole goal of that is that they integrate that to where yep. they can make it theirs with their music, that it doesn't stay an abstract principle that DHC taught, right. even though it is an abstract principle you taught, but the value of it is when it's integrated and it somehow becomes this, that person's, it, it informs them, it's, it takes root. It grows. Right. And I want to go back to your skeleton discussion, because even if everybody uses basically the same skeleton, I don't look at you and see your skeleton. I see at how you have become yourself. And I think that, that that's one of the reasons I love these blueprints is that they are so simple that they can then just form like a lattice work. If now I'm thinking about the garden again, I'm thinking about if you are the tomato and this, this thing helps structure you so that you can grow taller, you can, it supports you. I believe that's what these blueprints for creativity and just for anyone who's just coming in, this is a class that I just created and it's, it, 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 I just distilled a lot of the creative structures that I have seen in classical music and jazz and blues and stuff like that and so that people can use them 
to express themselves without having to learn all of classical music or blah, 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 blah. You're just using the structures. And it just reminds me of that lattice work on which something can grow and, and, and every plant is going to grow differently. That's right. Yes. And that, that is the heart of Jung's work, which is individuation, that each psyche soul grows in its own way what is unique to that individual soul. So that is one of the basic tenets. And if there is a goal of coming into analysis, it is to become more of who you are innately. And again, that there are a lot of variables that affect that, but it is unique to each individual and built over the skeleton of the parts of psyche, conscious self, unconscious self you know, the instinctive archetypal energies that we've talked about, the learned adaptive feedback loops we've internalized. By the way, I don't remember everything we've talked about. <laughs> I'm always happy when you bring it in and, and, and describe it again. I need to hear it over and over and over again. But what I'm hearing you say is that like in the blueprints for creativity, like in the distillation, um, that Jung took this complex of like who and tried to start breaking it down so that we can engage with it mm -hmm. is that right yeah yeah and so, and so i'm assuming that like a garden <clears throat> what you're doing in psychoanalysis is breaking down the things that aren't working and trying to make a structure that doesn't get in the way of the human to support that human blooming as themselves is am i near am i well you're near and then i do think that is what happens in the good enough analysis and i want to say the process is a little bit like what you and i do and that um we we seed each other and something grows and so it isn't there are structures that contribute to that and that we hold in our mind and that inform how as an analyst we respond but the process is what is transformative not the structures it is the process of that seeding and growing something together that in the case of the analysis is being grown in service of the psyche of the analysand of the client that that's the garden that's being tended. You know. I see, but the, but the analyst is, <laughs> now I'm thinking of the guy who came and, and got the raccoons out of my attic and, <laughs> and then made the door to do that. The, 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 that, that the, the, the analyst is there in service of that. In other words, they're not working on their own. May, they may have things happen to their own psyche, but they're there to listen and to and to um to to provide clarity right yeah the role of the analyst is there to be there in service of the psyche of the analysis that we're tending their garden the analyst is affected and then they go tend their garden with their analyst or in their own personal work yeah yeah <laughs> Really interesting, you know the the difference. God love to see a movie on that sometime. Just <laughs> the difference in the relationships and the questions, or how or how that happens. So okay, I know it's time that we need to come to an end, and so I just want to kind of go back to the beginning that we were we were looking at um, how we grow the garden of ourselves and how we deal with the pests of ourselves. And I'm sure there are all uh, there are a lot of logistical things. And I, it sounds like one of the first is to track, is to become aware of what you're doing and what's happening and, and whether that in fact is leading to your what your intentions are. And um, so and and I believe I've observed that simply through putting our attention on that, becoming aware, getting clarity, things seem to recover on their own. Mm -hmm. In many cases, through clarity. I don't understand how or why that is, but I have seen it over and over again. And so that 
and, and I'm thinking in my garden as well, uh, just, just getting clarity on what I'm doing, you know, put, making sure that the, the irrigation is in in the right place and, and making sure it gets watered and then w looking at it every day. I don't know what the exact analogy is, mm -hmm. but certainly in our, in our minds. So that's what I am going to do is I'm going to get really curious mm -hmm. about um, what, what is my, int what do I say my intention is? What do I actually do? And not and, and take the judgment out of it, but just observe, just track it. What do I say I'm gonna do? What do I say I wanna do? And what do I actually do? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's beautiful. And, I, and it's kind of like me with looking at my inaction or inertia in this one area, that when I could really begin to say, okay, what's behind that? What's underneath that? What's holding that? up or what's keeping me trapped in it is another metaphor then I could begin to see these little subtle things that I was saying that were creating this energy state then I could make a choice to begin to say something different and nurture something different and address whatever the truth was of what was being said Okay, yeah. so it sounds like you're tracking not only what your intention and what you actually do, but the atmosphere around that, the, the yes. sounds, you know, what are you saying? What are you hearing? What are you maybe physically doing? And then you're starting to get an impression. And then, and, and then you may or may not have to actually choose to do different things. Because sometimes when we, when we just become aware, we then, it becomes obvious, no, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, because in that moment, that awareness constellates a different felt experience in the body. At that moment, we have a different consciousness. Something new has just bloomed in that moment. Because the kind of awareness you're talking about where it just clarifies and something shifts isn't just a head awareness. It is an awareness in our conscious and unconscious where something has shifted. So it's not an intellectual exercise. All right. And, <laughs> go on, go on. Well, and I think that's important because a lot of people have awarenesses as intellectual insights, but nothing changes because it's all from here up. It's not an awareness from here down. You know, it, it's not a full intelligence of their being involved. It's just a gymnastic exercise of the head. And so I just want to make a distinction there because I think that's an important distinction to make. Well, again, and I'm, I'm having this sort of epiphany in, in the moment, which, um, which is that this answers my question, which is as we recover to our natural state, what is then the next level of that? Mm -hmm. And then in, in this conversation, we realized it has to do from reseeding. It has to do from relationship. And then you just said that when we have, I don't know exactly, I'll have to go back and listen. But then there's that moment when we, something happens and a new bloom yes. is born. And yes. that, that I think is life blooming and flowering. And that is the super natural state, but it really is just the state, our natural state that we may never have experienced. Absolutely. And, you know, I want to say here as we're, we're ending that the Western mystery tradition says that the supernatural works through natural processes, but what makes it appear supernatural is the concentration or focus of the energy. So that that's what makes something look supernatural. It's the intense focus or attention that constellates the change like that. I see. Okay. And I was thinking also that it may be a level of recovery or a level of what, whatever that we just haven't seen before because yeah. we never allowed ourselves to go to that place. And, and maybe don't super ultra natural, whatever it is. Yeah. All right. Well, this is something to think about and mm -hmm. explore and garden with in myself and begin to work with as the spring begins. Yes.
So Kathleen, thank you. <laughs> it was really fun. Um, and, and I I honestly feel like I have this new, I literally saw this new bloom inside myself. I saw this flower in the darkness that, um, that was not there before this conversation. That's great. Yeah, it yeah. is. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.